let's find out. Are we going to be doing it? Is this functional functioning or is this going to be something else completely? I don't even know. All right, let's find out. Let's move myself back over here now that we don't need to be all the way over, but let's do this. Styled and written. When I was younger, I thought the object-oriented programming was the only right way to code. And I thought the literal exact same thing. When I was younger, back in my childlike years, I too thought object-oriented was the only way to do it. And therefore, when I built my first video game, I used seven layers of inheritance. And eventually I cried, cried, and cried. For I could not figure out where and why my bugs were flowing through the system and I had no idea how or why it happened. So I cried and I cried and I cried. Java was the best language. So obviously I wasn't the brightest back then. I realized constricting myself to one paradigm wasn't a smart decision and expanding my options could greatly increase my coding quality. I'm going to mainly focus on the object oriented and functional Do you like that paradigm. screen tear by the way? How good was that screen tear, huh? I should switch to Wayland. I keep saying that every week. I still don't. Uh, OOP, most used. As OOP is arguably the most used paradigm, and functional programming is also growing rapidly in popularity. While coding, there's multiple ways to solve a problem, making the debate of which paradigm is the best useless. The idea behind object-oriented programming is to rely on the concepts of classes and objects, where a class could be considered a blueprint to instantiate objects. Didn't, we, didn't uh, Code Aesthetics do something very similar to this? Didn't uh, code aesthetics do like this very, 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 very similar thing, even using images? Do I remember that correctly? I can't remember. He was doing it for the difference between inheritance versus composition. Classes usually represent a broad category such as cars, animals, or any other encompassing field. For example, if I actually quit doing a lot of that for the most part. I try not to think of classes like that a class foo with attributes supply and type we can now create as many objects of food as we like to add some more functionality the class food can have methods most classes are even more powerful than they look like as they can be extended from to make more subclasses here kitkat can extend from food i already hate everything i see with kitkat everything's the same except the consume function is overridden while this specific example is extremely simple an object-oriented design allows for flexible code reuse Object-oriented programming can be made more robust with features like abstract classes, interfaces, virtual functions, multiple inheritance. You're not allowed to use the term robust in multiple inheritance, okay? Yeah. Yeah, okay. You need to know this. Or I'm going to send you straight to Karen's office. Ridiculous. Don't ever say multiple inheritance and robust in my startup again, okay? <laughs> It's not a marker. That was me being serious. Okay, chat? You know, I'm serious about two things in the world, okay? Serious number one, you don't joke about multiple inheritance. And number two, five dollars a month! That's what I'm serious about, okay? And more, but that's beyond the scope of this video. Something you'll probably hear a lot related to object-oriented programming are its four pillars. These are inheritance, polymorphism, encapsulation, and abstraction. Yes, I don't like to use that. I think we all use polymorphism in some way. I think encapsulation is just a great idea. That's just pretty much programming. In fact, it's really hard not to encapsulate data. I mean, you really have to be trying to not encapsulate data. You know what I mean? Welcome to Costco. I, I forgot to turn off alerts. Welcome to Costco. I forgot to turn off alerts. Alerts are off. Thank you. Uh, an abstraction. People love this. You know, this term for me just always just means everything. Abstraction. You're like, wasn't everything kind of an abstraction? If you really think about it, we're always abstracting. Like JavaScript is an abstraction over C++. You know what I mean? You like that? You like that? JavaScript's just C++ syntax sugar, baby. Okay? Syntax sugar, that's all it is. It's just syntax sugar, that's all it is. Uh, no. No, it's not. Actually, it is. Just syntax sugar. That's all it is. That's all it is, baby. Inheritance is what I mentioned earlier about KitKat. That's why I think they're both shitty. Sending food. KitKats are still a type of food, so they should be able to take all the properties of food. Encapsulation allows classes to manage how they hide data, 
allowing access through either the class itself or a function. For example, if we have a class for a person, we wouldn't want their address or SSN to be public. Otherwise, any other class would be able to access and potentially change those properties. Yep. On the flip side, something like your name could be public, as that data isn't as sensitive. The best practice is to declare any variable. Chat, what's the name? What's the, ch what's the name, chat? The name. That's right. Thank you. Thank you for, if you don't say Java, don't say the Java gen, okay? That's inappropriate. It's inappropriate. Okay? The name is JS is syntax sugar for C++. A gen. As private, so nothing outside the class can affect it unless it needs to be public. Abstraction is similar to encapsulation. Okay, hey, 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 hey. If you're going to make all these fancy, if you're going to make all these fancy things, you better put a space right here, okay? Okay, leave room for the Holy Spirit is what we said during high school dances, okay? At least that's what the teacher said, okay? Okay, that's very important. Put a space right here. I expect it. It's just you're, you're offending me. However, it's less about data safety, but rather for easy. Oh, now you put a space! Okay! If you put six, six, seven space indenting? Or six? I'm not even sure what's going on here, okay? We gotta work on your, your we gotta work on it, okay? I know you're using that motion canvas thing. I know you are, okay? But careful now. If we have a string and we want to make it lowercase, we can just call the to lowercase function, as we don't need to know exactly how the string will be made into lowercase. Polymorphism is also similar to inherit. I'm not gonna lie to you. Okay, if you're gonna do sweet stuff, you gotta put the right indents, right? Like these indents, they're, they're just emotionally hurting me. Like this indent, look at this. What have you done here? What have you done? This thing's indented like 12 characters, okay? I don't even know how to do something. You got some sort of, you have some form of Fibonacci. It's like one, one, two. Okay, you can even see it. The break has the same thing. One, one, two. You have Fibonacci indenting and it's emotionally painful. Okay, and what happened to this parenthesis? Okay, this parenthesis should have been back here, but instead it's up here, makes everything confusing. Polymorphism is also similar to inheritance, except it's about modifying behavior rather than taking properties. In my earlier example, polymorph. This is the reason. This is the exact reason why I hate polymorphism, or not polymorphism. Why I hate uh, inheritance? Okay, because you're inheriting over behavior, but you're relying on inherited properties. This is really where I think it all falls apart. Is this right here? Is 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 properties. That's why traits in Rust are really great. This is why interfaces tend to be better, why people tend to be okay with interfaces, especially like in something like Golang. Golang kind of has the same feel to it, where you're able not to rely on the properties, right? You're like, that's not just how it works, okay? You have you, yourself, you are the object, and then that's what you do. I know we're not even going to talk about that. We're not even going to talk about it, okay? But either way, I just hate that. It just drives me nuts. I think that's why I hate inheritance. Some is used when we override the consume function. Object-oriented programming is not perfect, and it has its issues. First of all, the code made with object-oriented patterns will generally be longer than other styles. There's just more boilerplate code to write, and if the project doesn't need all the boilerplate, there will be a lot of extra unnecessary code. That's not true! You can't give Java... You can't put Java... You can't just put Java's public static void main string args! As an example for OOP's lengthiness, okay, that's Java's lengthiness. That's where functional programming can come in. I apologize in advance if I get something wrong with functional programming, as I don't have a great deal of experience in it. That being said, reading and writing well-written functional programs feel great, as they can be extremely elegant. Oh, oh, now we're calling Python functional. Okay, then. Okay, I see what kind of world we're living in. I see what's happening now. The main idea with functional programming is that we use functions as our primary building block as opposed to classes and objects. The functions are usually pure functions avoiding shared state, mutable data, and side effects. For example, if we have a function that adds two variables and changes a global variable to the sum, this would not be a functional programming concept as we introduced a side effect. The side effect was caused by altering a piece of data beyond our scope, which is the function. Side Isn't that always the joke? It's the reason why nothing's ever actually written in functional programming. 
because you can't do side effects. Side effects are something developers avoid as they can cause bugs that are completely unexpected. We can make the function pure by not altering the global variable. Another concept of functional programming is that data is immutable because mutable data can also cause side effects. Instead of having shared state and mutable data, we can alter data by using other functions such as map. This is why JavaScript is sometimes so slow. Immutable data, bro! Mutable data, bro! And then you get a bunch of copies. Just a bunch of spread operators spreading their filth all over the program. All map does is run a function on every element of an iterable. In this case, we just append a fire emoji to the end of each string. Map is also an example of a higher order function, as it's a function that takes another function as a parameter. Mm. Functional programming has many benefits that object-oriented programming doesn't have. You can get these beautiful or ugly one-liners depending on how you like your code to look. Please, no mentioning of Ramda, please. It's also far easier to track down bugs as a bug should only be contained within one function and won't have you jumping through 10 different files and nested objects. Although- I've never found that to be true, right? I've never found that to be true. Anytime you're finding a bug, it results in me jumping to a bu bunch of different places, whether it's uh, oop, fp, or f poop, right? No matter what, what, what the, whatever the style is that you've created, it's like it's always a pain in the ass to figure out where things go wrong, right? Like they, that's 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 like that's what makes a really good engineer is, or one of the things that makes a really good engineer is your ability to go and figure out what the hell's going on. You know what I mean? Functional programming seems like a developer's dream with smaller projects. It can be considerably harder to scale up in certain cases. This is because modeling a problem in functional programming is not as easy as it is in object-oriented programming. For example, take a car that needs maintenance on a certain date. In this case, we can just have a car object with an attribute for when it needs maintenance. In a functional approach, as there is no state, we would have to use a function to find out if the car needs maintenance. I'm not sure if that's the best way to do it, but if there's other methods, feel free to comment them down below as I would love to know about them. I mean, you know, these kind of concepts, there are, you know, there's like, I know Haskell has a similar idea, but there's trait objects in Rust where you can attach methods to structs. Right, you don't so you don't necessarily need floating things. I think this is more of like a consequence of probably Python or uh, JavaScript, where instead of having this beautiful like ability to press dot and see all the methods available for that specific type, instead you have the opposite, which is you have to go to a file and discover all the methods for a type if all the methods for a type are contained within one file. And so I find that you know it totally depends on the language, the ease of use of functional. And it's not always the same, right? It's not all, it doesn't always feel the same. And it can be quite tricksy. Yes, obviously this is not this, you know what I mean? As you can see, both these paradigms, just like every other paradigm, I know, have their don't benefits. Look, don't look at the statement, don't look at the statement. But also a wide variety of issues. I read something on Stack Overflow along the lines of- First mistake, don't read things on Stack Overflow, okay? because you can't even figure out how to measure your dick on Stack Overflow. Object orientation can improve with functional programming, and I agree. No more orientation, we're not orientating things. Not everything has to be the same, however, the functions can improve. Methods can take the principles behind functional programming functions. They don't need to have zero side effects, however, minimizing them would be extremely helpful for debugging. The longer object-oriented code can also be split up into sub-methods to do smaller tasks. And since object orientation allows abstraction and encapsulation, the end user doesn't need to see those changes. Wherever applicable, the one-liners and more concise code patterns from functional programming can be used to create elegant code. Mixing paradigms and code patterns can increase code quality in so many situations. I think there's this concept that floats around, and I'm not sure if I'm incorrect or if I am correct, but just because you use functions does not mean it's functional programming. I think a lot of time people goof up functional programming for procedural programming. You know what I mean? And so what is functional programming in the JavaScript world is actually just procedural programming for the most part. And that's that. That's all you're doing. You're just procedural programming Andy. You're doing procedural programming Andy things. And that's that. Situations. Multi-paradigm languages are on the rise and are here to stay. 
it's better to embrace the multi-paradigm approach rather than to bottleneck your code by sticking to only one. Nothing. As with any choice, there's going to be a pros, but there's also going to be Not going to fall for it. You might as well take the best from all paradigms and work off of that. Not going to make a joke. Thanks for watching. I'll see you guys next time. I mean, I like the general. I like the general take of this video. General take of this video is actually really good. Which is, you you should if you do know some level of functional programming. I'm very weak on the functional programming. Like I'm like EDND, right? Like I know very very little. But taking good concepts from each approach is really really nice. Like I'm pretty careful when I create classes. If I create a class, I never allow inheritance. Right? You just kind of have to come up with some basic things like some basic general rules and that's that and for the most part you will do very very fine these people that are very dogmatic about one approach or the other i find that actually almost always is the worst and you know what i'm going to be real here the reason why it's almost always the worst to be purely oop or purely functional is because the actual best programming technique is procedural i'm sorry sorry sucks to suck the name is the primogen